Welcome back to the channel everyone, today we're diving deep into some groundbreaking news that could significantly impact thousands of Canadian seniors. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has just unveiled a new old age security OAS plan, and it's generating quite a buzz across the country. Before we jump into the details, let me remind you to hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications so you never miss out on important updates like this one. Your support means the world to us, and it helps us continue bringing you the latest news and analysis on Canadian policies and financial matters. Now, let's get to the heart of the matter. Starting this August, low-income OAs recipients could be eligible for payments of up to $2,300. Yes, you heard that right, $2,300. This is no small sum, and it has the potential to make a real difference in the lives of many seniors struggling with rising costs of living. In today's video, we're going to break down every aspect of this new plan. We'll look at who's eligible, how the payments will work, and what this means for the broader landscape of senior support in Canada. We'll also dive into the political and economic context surrounding this decision, explore some potential impacts, and even hear from experts in the field. Let's start by breaking down the key elements of Trudeau's new OAS plan. The basics are that the plan introduces payments of up to $2,300 for low-income seniors, set to begin in August of this year. This initiative is part of a broader strategy to support Canadians facing rising living costs. In terms of eligibility, the payments are targeted specifically at low-income seniors who must already be eligible for old-age security OAs. There may be additional income thresholds or other criteria which we'll discuss in more detail shortly. Regarding the payment structure, while the maximum payment is $2,300, it's important to note that not everyone will receive this full amount. The exact amount each individual receives may depend on factors such as their income level and other benefits they're already receiving. As for timing and frequency, the first payments are scheduled to begin in August, but at this point it's unclear whether this will be a one-time payment or part of a series of payments. To understand who might benefit from this new plan, it's crucial to first understand the basics of OAS eligibility. Generally, to receive OAs, you must be 65 years of age or older, a Canadian citizen or legal resident at the time your OAS application is approved and have resided in Canada for at least 10 years since the age of 18. While we don't have the exact income thresholds for this new payment yet, we can look at existing OAS structures for clues. Currently, the OAS pension is reduced when a senior's annual income reaches $79,054 as of 2021, and is completely clawed back when income exceeds $128,137. For this new payment, it's likely that the income threshold will be significantly lower, given that it's targeted at low-income seniors. We might expect it to align more closely with the Guaranteed Income Supplement GI's thresholds, which are much lower. The announcement of up to $2,300 suggests a sliding scale based on income. This approach is common in many government benefit programs to ensure that those with the greatest need receive the most support. Potential scenarios could include seniors with the lowest incomes receiving the full $2,300, a gradual reduction in the payment amount as income increases, and a cutoff point beyond which seniors would not be eligible for the payment. The August start date raises some interesting questions. Is this timing related to the fiscal year or perhaps in response to anticipated economic challenges later in the year? As for frequency, while it's been announced as a single payment, there's always the possibility that it could become a recurring benefit if deemed successful and necessary. To truly understand the significance of this new OIS plan, we need to look at the broader context in which this decision was made. Several factors have likely influenced this move, including the rising cost of living, economic recovery post-COVID, demographic shifts, the political landscape, international comparisons, and lessons from the pandemic. One of the most pressing issues facing Canadians, particularly seniors on fixed incomes, is the increasing cost of living. Canada, like many countries, has been experiencing higher than usual inflation rates. As of the latest data, the annual inflation rate in Canada is hovering around 4-5%, to well above the Bank of Canada's 2% target. This means that the purchasing power of fixed incomes, like pensions, is being eroded more quickly than usual. Many Canadian cities have seen skyrocketing housing costs, both for homeowners and renters. This puts particular pressure on seniors who may be on fixed incomes. While Canada has a public health care system, many seniors face additional out-of-pocket health care costs for items not covered by the public system, such as dental care, vision care, and certain medications. Rising energy prices have been a significant contributor to the increased cost of living, affecting heating bills and transportation costs. 
The COVID-19 pandemic has had a profound impact on the Canadian economy and on seniors in particular. Many seniors faced increased isolation and additional costs related to health and safety measures during the pandemic. Some seniors who supplemented their income with part-time work may have lost this income source due to pandemic-related job losses or health concerns. The economic recovery has been uneven, with some sectors and demographics recovering more quickly than others. Canada, like many developed countries, is facing an aging population. Statistics Canada projects that by 2030, about 23% of Canadians will be aged 65 and older. This demographic shift puts pressure on pension systems and increases the importance of ensuring adequate support for seniors. The political context is also crucial to understanding this decision. The Liberal government, led by Justin Trudeau, has made social support a key part of their platform. This move could be seen as a way to shore up support among older voters. It may also be a response to calls from opposition parties and advocacy groups for increased support for seniors. It's worth noting how Canada's support for seniors compares internationally. According to the Organization for Economic Colorado Operation and Development OECD, Canada's public spending on old age benefits as a percentage of GDP is lower than the OECD average. This new payment could be seen as a step towards bringing Canada more in line with other developed countries in terms of senior support. The COVID-19 pandemic highlighted and exacerbated many existing inequalities. Seniors, especially those in long-term care facilities, were disproportionately affected by the health impacts of the virus. The pandemic also shone a light on the financial precarity of many seniors, particularly those with low incomes. These revelations may have influenced the government's decision to provide additional support. Now that we've explored the context, let's consider the potential impacts of this new OAS plan. The most obvious and immediate impact will be financial relief for eligible seniors. For a senior living on a very low income, an extra $2,300 could make a significant difference. This could help with essential expenses like food, housing, and healthcare costs. It might allow some seniors to afford items or services that improve their quality of life, which they previously couldn't afford. From a macroeconomic perspective, this payment could act as a form of economic stimulus. Low-income individuals typically spend a higher proportion of additional income rather than saving it. This increased spending could help support local businesses and contribute to economic growth. However, the impact would depend on the total amount distributed and how recipients choose to use the funds. This payment has the potential to lift some seniors out of poverty, at least temporarily. Canada's poverty line varies by region but generally ranges from about $18,000 to $22,000 for a single person. For a senior living just below this line, an extra $2,300 could potentially push them above it. However, the long-term impact on poverty rates would depend on whether this becomes a recurring payment. Financial stress can have significant impacts on health and well-being, particularly for older adults. This additional income could reduce stress and anxiety related to financial insecurity. It might allow some seniors to afford healthier food options or necessary medical equipment not covered by public health insurance. Reduced financial stress could potentially lead to better overall health outcomes. This plan could be seen as a step towards greater social equity. It specifically targets low-income seniors who are often among the most vulnerable in society. It acknowledges the challenges faced by those living on fixed incomes in a time of rising costs. However, it may also raise questions about support for other vulnerable groups. Implementing this new payment will require administrative effort. The government will need to determine eligibility, process payments, and communicate with recipients. There may be challenges in ensuring all eligible seniors are aware of and able to access the payment. The cost of administering the program will need to be considered alongside the direct financial outlay. The introduction of this payment will have implications for government spending. The total cost will depend on how many seniors are eligible and at what amount. This will need to be balanced against other budgetary priorities and considerations. It may spark debates about taxation and government debt. This move is likely to have political ramifications. It could boost support for the liberal government among older voters. Opposition parties may criticize the plan as insufficient or, conversely, as fiscally irresponsible. It could set expectations for similar support for other demographic groups. This new payment could have broader implications for senior support policies. It might be seen as an acknowledgement that existing supports are insufficient. It could open the door to discussions about more comprehensive reforms to senior support systems. There may be calls to make this a permanent, perhaps annual, payment rather than a one-time measure. 
Finally, this move could influence societal attitudes towards senior support. It reinforces the idea that supporting low-income seniors is a social responsibility. It might spark broader conversations about aging, retirement, and financial security in Canada. It could influence younger generations' expectations and planning for their own retirement. To provide a well-rounded view of this new OA's plan, let's consider some expert opinions and analysis. While we don't have direct quotes related to this specific announcement yet, we can draw on expert insights about senior support in Canada more broadly. Economists like Dr. Tammy Sherl, professor of economics at Wilfrid Laurier University, have previously commented on OAAs and GIs. The OAAs and GIs have been very effective in reducing poverty among seniors. However, there are still gaps, particularly for single seniors and those with limited work history. This new payment could be seen as an attempt to address some of these gaps. However, economists might question the long-term sustainability of one-time payments versus structural changes to the system. Gerontologists emphasize the importance of holistic support for seniors. Dr. Veronique Boscart, chair of the Canadian Association on Gerontology, has stated financial support is crucial, but we also need to consider social connection, healthcare access, and age-friendly communities. Any policy aimed at supporting seniors should take a multifaceted approach. While this payment addresses the financial aspect, experts in aging might argue for a more comprehensive strategy. Policy analysts like Andrew Jackson, senior policy advisor to the Broadman Institute, have previously written about the need for pension reform Canada's retirement income system has been successful in reducing poverty among seniors. But it fails to replace earnings at an adequate level for many middle-income earners. Policy analysts might see this new payment as a stopgap measure rather than a long-term solution to the challenges facing Canada's pension system. Advocacy groups such as CARP, formerly the Canadian Association of Retired Persons, have long advocated for increased support for seniors. Bill Van Gorder, Chief Policy Officer at CARP, has stated while any increase in support is welcome, what seniors really need is a comprehensive review and update of our entire system of supports for older Canadians. Advocacy groups might view this payment as a positive step but continue to push for more systemic changes. Financial planners often emphasize the importance of individual retirement planning. As Jason Heath, a certified financial planner, has noted government benefits provide a foundation, but Canadians need to take an active role in planning for their retirement. This includes saving, investing, and understanding all the benefits available to them. Financial experts might caution against relying too heavily on government support and continue to advise diversified retirement planning. Experts in international social policy might draw comparisons with other countries. For instance, Dr. John Miles, Professor Emeritus of Sociology at the University of Toronto, has previously compared Canada's system to those of other countries. Canada's system of old age security has been relatively successful in preventing poverty among seniors, especially when compared to the United States. However, some European countries provide more generous and comprehensive support. This perspective might lead to questions about whether Canada should be looking to other countries for models of senior support. Public health professionals often highlight the link between income and health outcomes. Dr. Teresa Tam, Canada's chief public health officer, has emphasized this connection income is a critical determinant of health. Adequate income support for vulnerable populations, including low-income seniors, can have significant positive impacts on health outcomes. From this perspective, the new OIS payment could be seen as a public health measure as much as an economic one. Legal scholars might consider the implications of this payment in terms of rights and entitlements. As noted by Professor Martha Jackman of the University of Ottawa, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms protects equality rights, including on the basis of age. Any changes to senior benefits need to be considered in light of these constitutional protections. This raises questions about the legal and constitutional implications of targeted benefits like this new payment. While this new OS plan is likely to be welcomed by many, it's important to consider potential criticisms and counterarguments. Some might argue that $2,300, while helpful, is not enough to make a significant long-term difference to seniors living in poverty. Critics might call for more substantial, ongoing support rather than a one-time payment. The government might respond that this payment is intended as supplementary support on top of existing benefits, not a complete solution to senior poverty. There could be debates about whether a targeted approach focusing on low-income seniors is more effective than a universal increase to OS payments. Proponents of the targeted approach might argue that it allows for more substantial support to those who need it most, making more efficient use of limited resources. Some fiscal conservatives might question the affordability of this measure, 
especially if it were to become a recurring payment. Supporters could argue that supporting seniors is a necessary social investment that can lead to reduced healthcare costs and increased economic activity in the long run. Adding another payment to the existing system of OAAZAs and CPP could make the senior benefit system more complex and potentially harder to navigate. The government might emphasize efforts to make the application and distribution process as simple and automatic as possible. Some might question why this support is only available to seniors when other age groups are also facing financial challenges. Defenders of the policy might point out the unique vulnerabilities of seniors, particularly their limited ability to increase their income through employment. Critics might argue that one-time payments don't address the structural issues in Canada's senior support system and that more comprehensive reform is needed. The government might counter that this payment is part of a broader strategy to support seniors and that other initiatives are also being considered. In conclusion, Trudeau's new OACE plan, offering payments of up to $2,300 for low-income seniors starting in August, is a significant development in Canada's approach to senior support. While it promises immediate financial relief for many vulnerable seniors, it also raises important questions about the long-term structure of Canada's pension system, the balance between targeted and universal benefits, and the overall approach to supporting an aging population. As we've seen, this plan has implications that go far beyond just the financial aspect. It touches on issues of health, social equity, economic stimulus, and even Canada's position in the global context of senior support. The diverse perspectives from economists, gerontologists, policy analysts, and other experts highlight the complexity of this issue and the need for a multifaceted approach to supporting seniors. As this plan rolls out, it will be crucial to monitor its implementation, assess its impact, and continue the broader conversation about how best to support Canada's seniors in the face of rising costs and changing demographics. Whether you're a senior yourself, have elderly loved ones, or are simply interested in Canadian social policies, this is a development worth watching closely. As we continue to monitor the rollout of this new OAS plan, it's important to consider its potential long-term implications. One key question is whether this one-time payment could evolve into a more permanent feature of Canada's senior support system. If it proves effective in alleviating financial stress for low-income seniors, there may be calls to make it an annual or even quarterly payment. Another aspect to consider is how this plan might influence retirement planning for younger generations. Will the possibility of additional government support in their senior years affect how Canadians save and invest for retirement? Financial advisors and policymakers will need to address these questions in the coming years. Furthermore, this plan could spark renewed discussions about the retirement age in Canada. With people living longer and healthier lives, some argue that the age of eligibility for OAAs and other senior benefits should be raised. However, others contend that such a move would disproportionately affect lower-income individuals who often work in more physically demanding jobs. Lastly, it's worth considering how this plan fits into Canada's broader social safety net. Could similar targeted payments be implemented for other vulnerable groups, such as people with disabilities or low-income families with children? The success or failure of this OS plan could have far-reaching effects on social policy in Canada for years to come. Remember, if you found this information helpful, don't forget to like, subscribe and hit that notification bell so you never miss an update on important news like this. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next video.